Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 163. Today, we have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and in the state of New Hampshire, a very, very special guest, Nathan Wilkins. Nathan, what's going on, man? How's it going, brother? It's going great. Uh, You know, I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since we scheduled it, and I learned before we hit record that you are 22 years old, which uh, is funny because I just turned 30. But when I talk to people who are in there, you know, 20, 21, 22, the energy feels right. And so I, I'll leave this conversation thinking, oh, yeah, me and Nathan are both 22. And then I'll have to remind myself that I'm 30. So uh, I'm excited for your energy and you are wise beyond your years. And we'll get into that. But before we do, uh, how would you introduce yourself to people listening? So first off, like, like Joe said, I'm 22 years old. Uh, I'd say my whole life really changed three years ago uh, with the 75 hard challenge. You know, I was kind of, I was stuck in a, in a certain place and, you know, I didn't really like where my life was going. So I knew I had to make a change. So 75 hard was kind of that lifestyle change that, that I needed. So those 75 days go through, I crushed the challenge and it really instilled an insane amount of discipline inside of me. Uh, which is exactly what I needed to really kickstart this whole entire journey for me. Um, after that, that led into to running, that led into fitness, uh, lifting, 100 mile races, marathons, all of that. But I can really thank 75 Hard uh, kickstarting that off and just really kickstarting off a journey that I'm really proud of. Mm. So before we get into life after those 75 days, I want some context as to what life was like before those 75 days. I mean, it sounds like the Nathan that grew up maybe wasn't the same Nathan that we're, we're talking to today. And um, I would love to hear more about the Nathan before the 75 hard. So what, what were you like growing up and what led you to that place of wanting a challenge to change yourself? So I've always been like an extremely competitive person. I just didn't really, you know, I played soccer in high school, but I didn't really know where to really put that competitiveness. So, and that's where I found the running, the fitness, uh, the social media, but, you know, I just, I kind of, I felt lost. I didn't really, I didn't have a purpose in life. I was just kind of, just kind of coasting and I didn't really have like a true passion that, yeah, I could work towards and, and goals that I could work towards every single day. And once I started setting more goals for myself, it just, you you know that you just like, you get up every day, like wanting to chase these certain goals. But before I had no goals, I didn't really know what my passion was, which I've definitely found now. But, uh, you know, I just, I just felt lost overall. And it was just, you just, you just kind of feel stuck. It's not a, not a great feeling. Mm. If there's a piece of advice that 22 year old Nathan could give to, let's say, I don't know, 16 year old Nathan, uh, what would you say to that younger version of yourself? I would definitely say to just go try new things. Like don't at first 75 hard challenge just sounded terrifying to me. It was scary. You know, I'd never worked out before. I'd never, never ran before, but just go out, do hard things. And just, you know, that's, that's how you, that's how you grow. That's how you learn a shit ton about yourself. So I just say, yeah, you just gotta, gotta go try new things. Mm. So I am guessing we'll circle back to all of this when we get to a later point in the conversation. But for now, I would love to focus in on the first big question that I ask guests on the podcast. And so when you look at your 22 years of life so far, 
what's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle that you didn't choose for yourself? So something that happened to you or that uh, you kind of walked into, but, but didn't have a choice in the matter. And it was just the hardest thing you've had to handle. You know, it's like, I've had a pretty great life so far. It's like, it's tough to, to go into depth on that, but like, obviously there's, there's passing of, of family members, there's passing of grandparents, like, you know, all of that stuff. But I mean, obviously that's probably the hardest stuff that, that can happen to you, but it's really just going back to, to finding what your purpose is and really feeling lost prior. I mean, it's just, that was probably the toughest thing for me. Like I had before I had a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of social anxiety before and just doing these things, meeting new people, it's really, really brought me out of my shell. And it's definitely, it's saved my life a hundred percent. I was having a conversation with a client the other day and we were talking about how, you know, here born in North America, uh, there's a certain privilege that comes along with that. You know, we have certain freedoms and certain things that uh, other people don't have. And I was sharing with him how in 2018, I went on a service trip to Guatemala and I, you know, had the opportunity to serve a lot of people who don't have access to electricity or running water. And it was very eye opening for me. And there was this one morning where I woke up and we were taking a, a couple hour bus ride to this very remote village. And I remember my phone didn't charge overnight. It must have not been fully plugged into the outlet. And I was so frustrated, right? I was, I was in a bad mood all morning because my iPhone didn't charge. And after this three hour bus ride, we get to this village and, you know, people are living under tin roofs with just four wooden posts, no electricity, no running water. And we get to this uh, home of a, of a young boy who had muscular dystrophy. He was stuck in a wheelchair. Uh, his legs and arms were stuck in a bent position, so he couldn't move. He had uh, a few years ago been caught in a house fire where he couldn't escape. So he was covered in burns. And we gave him this little Hot Wheels car and he was the happiest child I'd ever seen. And it was in that moment I realized that the problems I'm going through really aren't that bad in the grand scheme of things. There are people who have it so much worse, but happiness and sadness are all relative. And the hardest thing that someone's gone through is the hardest thing that someone's gone through, no matter what it is. And, uh, and I wanted to share that to put things in perspective. But with that being said, you know, the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle is the hardest thing you've ever had to handle. And I would love to talk more about being lost because I am not guessing when I say this, I know for a fact, there are people listening to this episode who feel so lost right now. And so if you could take us back to that season in your life where you felt lost, do you remember the thoughts? Do you remember grasping for direction and not knowing where to look or how to get there? I mean, t take us back there if you can. Yeah. So I'd like, I mean, I'd wake up in the mornings and my heart would be beating a million miles an hour. Like you just, you have no clue where to go and, and what to do. And it's just, it's such a, it's an awful feeling. Like no one, no one ever wants to feel that. But going back, like I said, I think trying new things, getting out of your comfort zone, that's really where you're going to find your true passions. And that's really where you're going to find, you know, your, your true self. And that's something that I didn't like when I was lost. I didn't like change and, and change is everything. Like if you're not comfortable with change, you're, you're kind of screwed. Like you need to be able to adapt to change and, and the people that are the most successful can, can do just that. But yeah, I, I'd really say like, just, I don't know, most people that, I don't know, you just, you have to, you have to, you have to change. Like, and I felt so lost without, without change. Yeah. There's, there's a really interesting thing that's happened for me over the past decade. And I don't know if you've experienced this uh, or you will experience this. And that goes for you and anybody listening. But, you know, I went through a season of life where I felt very lost. And eventually I found my footing and I understood what you just expressed, right? Change is, is the only constant. Life changes and you have to be able to adapt. And it's not about what happens to us. It's about how we choose to respond. And the choices we make are entirely within our control. And so you go out, you meet new people, you try new things, you do your best. And eventually you start to find your footing. And once I found my footing, I thought, okay, I've got it. Uh, and then a few years later, 
uh, that footing, all of a sudden you start to slip and you realize, okay, I might not be lost again, but I feel like I'm slipping into a place where I'm not sure what I want anymore. I'm not sure if this is the right direction for me. And I hesitate to use the word doubt, uh, but you almost begin to question whether or not the path you once thought was the path for you is still the path for you. And that could be a really confusing place. Uh, and so I, I don't know if you've experienced that at all over the past three years since you found your footing after 75 hard, but I think that's something a lot of people in life experience in general. hundred percent. And I just graduated college as well. So it's like, I'm at that point where the whole world's on my hands and I get to decide what to do, but it also can be an extremely scary thing. It's like, do I, what job do I go into? Do I pursue the coaching that I'm doing? Like there's just, there's so many options and everyone has, you know, like an idea of what they want out of you, but only, only you can, can choose that uh, deep down. So, I mean, yeah, like I said, it's a scary, it's definitely a scary time, but I'm just, I'm excited for the new opportunities ahead. 100%. Mm. Yeah. It, it's almost harder sometimes when you have so many options, right? Mm -hmm. When you can do anything you want, it almost becomes hard to narrow it down. Exactly. And, um, you know, someone uh, last week asked me, you know, what does Joe's life look like when he's 40? Uh, and so I just turned 30. So that's 10 years from now. And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, right now I feel strong. I feel loved. I feel driven. I'm disciplined. Uh, I have a lot of those, those pieces in place in my life, right? These characteristics, if you will. And in 10 years, the only thing I could think of was I'll still be all of those things just whatever's around me will be a bit different, right? I might be in a different place from a physical standpoint. Uh, I hope to have children. Um, you know, my business might look a bit different, but deep down inside, I'll still be the same person, right? I'll still have those qualities. And I think it could be really easy to attach ourselves to titles and accomplishments and these tangible things in the outside world that aren't entirely within our control. But if we could just bring it back and say, who am I from a characteristic standpoint? You know, you said you're competitive. Uh, we know you're driven. You have these qualities. Those qualities will be with you no matter where you take them. And it might not be so much about where or what you do, but who you are. And as long as you can control for who you are, I think the rest takes care of itself. But that also doesn't make it any easier to decide what you're going to do because you still have to decide what you're going to do. And so as you think about that, where, where do you go, right? Fresh out of college. Uh, how does your mind work around all of it? So it's like part of me wants to go all in on, on coaching because like I'm coaching running fitness mindset as well. I know you do a lot of that as well. So part of me wants to go 100% into that. But then I have the social media as well. Like, and I love, I love filming. So do I, do I go into the more of the filming side and, and do open up my own business with the filming? And I mean, and I, like I said, I have the social media opportunity too, where I've grown my account to 117,000 now. So there's brand opportunities. There's so many opportunities that I could do with Instagram. I could eventually almost live, live off it if I really dove into it like a hundred percent. So it's like, it's where do I put my space? Like the coaching, the Instagram, the filming, like it's tough. Or do, or do I get a job doing something like social media with a company? Like there's so many different options. Mm. Now, this next question is not me trying to convince you to go one way or the other, but I'm one, just curious. And two, I think there are a lot of people out there who have similar questions, right? Do I go all in and bet on myself or do I take maybe an option that feels safe, if you will, uh, and do all this other stuff on the side. Uh, why not bet on yourself? Exactly. Yeah. That's in my, I've had, I have a great support system. My girlfriend, my brothers, I'm a triplet. So I forgot to mention that in the beginning, but, uh, I definitely, they're one of my biggest supporters and my girlfriend's a massive supporter too. And she's telling me like, you know, you're not meant for the, the corporate world. Just go in. Like, I know you're talented. I know you're extremely passionate about running, lifting. She's like, I'll be, I'll be there to support you if you go all in. So it's, it's definitely nice having that, having that support to back me up. But yeah, I definitely, you know, I, I, I do want to go, I do want to go all in and just, just pursue that because it's my passion. Like I said, I just, it'd be a shame not to, and I'm young as well. I'll say a couple of things. One, you have such a skill when it comes to social media 
uh, I can't tell you how many times a video of yours pops up on my feed. And I think to myself, wow, that is, that is so well done. And you know, the question, the question behind it then is, I wonder how long it took him to edit that because I get frustrated when it takes me more than 20, 30 minutes to make a video. And I think, man, he must have spent hours on that. So give us that piece of info, right? Those yeah. like real intricate reels with a lot of quick video changes, the audio, like how long do those take you? So every day I spend two to two and a half hours on those videos. And a lot of people, they don't, they don't see that. They just see a video every day and they're just, they don't even really think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I spend about two and two and a half hours because you got to find, I find the audio for it mm. and I have to go film by myself. I have a tripod that I set up. So I do all the filming by myself. Um, and then you got to go in and edit it all. You got to export it and then you got to put it into DaVinci Resolve to do all the editing, which people don't realize how long that takes. But I, at the beginning of the year, I set a goal to post every single day. So, and I believe consistency is absolutely everything. So yeah, so I'm, I set a goal to, to post every day, but it comes with two and a half hours of editing almost every single day. Um, and it's, it's definitely, it's tough. There's days where I sit at my computer not wanting to do it, but I know that I set that goal for myself and that I have to sit down and, and just grind it out no matter what. Mm. And you're right. People don't see the behind the scenes. And I, I think that's one of the places where social media can get a bit dangerous for some people because they see, oh, Nathan's doing it. Why can't I do it? And they spend, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes creating a, a post and they put it up every day for three days in a row and they get discouraged because they're not seeing the same results that maybe you've seen. And yet you've been grinding, putting in the hours, not every week, every day uh, for a period of time. And those results are um, because of the compounded consistent effort that you've put in. And so it's nice to hear that behind the scenes and hopefully people listening could apply that general filter to everything they consume and understand that there's work that goes into these things behind the scenes. And so I do want to, I do want to say something really quick too. So it took me a year. So I went from zero to 40,000, which was, which was huge for me. Uh, I mean, it took six months to go from zero to a thousand followers, which was, which was crazy. And then I hit a gro massive growth spurt. So in the year I hit 40,000. But then for another year, I didn't grow at all. I lost 5,000 followers for a whole entire year. And I posted, I missed probably three days out of the year. So that was extremely discouraging. But in the last six, seven months, I've grown 90,000 followers. So, I mean, anyone listening, you just gotta, you just gotta stick with it no matter what. And it'll, it'll be worth it in the end. And the best part about what you just said is that it applies to so much more than just social media. You know, that's, that's anything in life, uh, whether it's a career, whether it's a fitness pursuit, whether it is social media, right? It's not going to be linear. There might be seasons where it feels like you're banging your head against the wall, but you have to trust that if you're doing the right things, eventually the results will follow. And that's where I think the mindset of having uh, a relentless pursuit of something that you want paired with a complete unattachment to the outcome is just so dangerous and special and rare because it allows you to just keep going because you don't need the outcome in order to stay motivated. You are just so invested in the process and that requires commitment, which is exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. So along the lines of betting on yourself, you know, one of the other thoughts that I've had over the past three years of full-time entrepreneurship is that Sometimes the biggest risk is taking no risk at all. You know, um, I'm driven by a deep fear of regret. And uh, it took me a while to be able to put those words together, but I've felt that for, I think, most of my life. And what I mean by that is, you know, <laughs> I'll see an old couple walking down the street, right? Say two 80 year olds, they're holding hands, they're walking on the sidewalk. It's a nice summer day. And I'll get sad. And I, I get sad because I picture me in that position and I realize that at that point in my life someday, I won't have a lot of time left. And then that thought of not having a lot of time left brings me back to all the decisions I'm making right now. And I want to solve to minimize regret. I don't want to look back one day and wonder what if I did that or what if I went for it, right? Uh, I want to try these things. I want to take these risks because the worst thing that happens is that it fails miserably 
and I'm still here and I can get back up and try again. And so with that in mind, right, the social media, the coaching, there, I'm sure there are a few other things that you can bet on yourself with. Um, why not? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. I ask my brothers tell me that all the time. They're like, why not? Just, just go for it. I just wanted to throw in a quote that kind of related to what you said too. It's most people die at 25, but aren't bur buried until 75. And that just, that hits deep inside me. It really does. So I love that quote. And you also shared a quote with me when you scheduled this episode, it was about rent being due. Do you remember that quote? Yes, I do. Do you want to recite it? Yeah, let me let me pull it up. I don't have it exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's so good. I already know it's going to be the title of this episode because it's just, uh, yeah, it makes sense. And uh, it makes even more sense that you would be the person to say it, because this is what you live out. And so I'll have you share it when you've got it up. Okay, I got it. All right, go so for it's, it. Uh, success is never owned. It's only rented. And that rent is due every day. Mm, yeah. Now, a lot of people would feel pressure when they think of that, right? Pressure, I need to show up every single day. One, do you feel that pressure? And two, does that pressure ever tire tire you, exhaust you? So yeah, I'd be lying if it said it didn't exhaust me, but I do, I love pressure. Um, I I love having a busy day full of, full of activities and just, and hard work. I've just, I've got hard work passed down from my grandparents, from my dad, he's an extremely hard worker. So you know, pressure is, I, I love pressure hundred percent. And yeah, I do get, I do get stressed out, but I'm able to really plan my day out and just dial in all the tasks so I can, you know, get every, every single thing done and that I need to, and just progress. Mm. All right. One quick question before we move on to another big one. Is there anything that through the lens of social media, someone would assume about you uh, based on your content? that is actually not true, right? Is there anything about your social media that would lead somebody to believe something about you that might not actually be the case? Yeah, so it's more just like, oh, he he has it easy. He's He has muscle, he's good at running. He's, you know, he has good videos that, that he posts every day. But going back, they just, they don't see what you started with. Like two years ago, my first video was awful. Uh, my first run was terrible. My first lift was awful. Like there's a, there's a, another quote that I saw too. It's like your first workout will be bad. Your first podcast will be bad, et cetera. But you know, you just, you just have to start because you know, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be good at first. Yeah. It's not going to be good at first. And uh, you have to be willing to have that bad workout, record that bad podcast, do that thing. That's not the greatest in order to improve and eventually get to where you want to go. And so with that being said, I want to ask what's the hardest thing you've ever done on purpose and why did you do that thing? And it, it very well might be the 75 hard, but uh, give us your answer. So I'm going to have to say, I'll go away from the 75 hard. I'm going to have to say the, uh, the hundred mile race that I did was definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. All right. So give us some details, you know, when did that happen? Where did it take place and, and why did you do it? So February, uh, I ran my first, so February of uh, 2023, I ran my first marathon. And after that, I was like, you know, what's, what's next? What's next? So, you know, a few, a few months passed and BPN actually posted that they were going to be at the last man standing race. Uh, and this was in September, September 2nd, to be exact. Um, so I decided, you know, and I've only ran, I just ran 26 miles. That was the most I've ever ran. So I was like, you know what, I might as well sign up for this race, which is last man standing. And deep down, I knew I wanted to hit 100 miles. And I, like I said, I've only hit 26 miles. So I had to create a plan for myself. And, you know, I worked my ass off all summer long, I trained my ass off. And going into the race, I felt pretty confident that I was going to hit it. But going through the night at last man standing, like it's a, I was out there for 24 hours. Like you really, you start doubting yourself. It's three in the morning. It's four in the morning. You, you really start doubting yourself, but I definitely say the the hundred mile race was one of the toughest things that I've ever done just ment mentally and physically. Mm. So I want to hear about some of those darker, harder moments throughout the race, but just so we know, was it a hundred miles on the dot? Was it a little bit more? 
Yeah. So it was, it was 105 miles total. Wow. And so what was the deciding factor to stop at 105 uh, and, and not go more? So my calf ended up kind of giving out on the last lap, like deep down, I knew I wanted a hundred and I hit the hundred, but I'm kind of a very competitive person as we talked about, like, and I, I don't usually quit cause I would have just would have kept going. Cause there were still people, there was nine people still going, but um, yeah, my calf ended up kind of giving out and, you know, I didn't want to just, I didn't want to have an injury for, for three, four months. It really wasn't worth it at that point. So I ended up, I ended up stopping and Dean it's called yeah DNF so definitely definitely hurt the pride a little bit but I'm I'm just really I'm happy I hit the goal of 100. It's wild to think that you get a DNF for that um I guess everybody gets a DNF except the last man standing right exactly <laughs> um but I wanted to ask you know why you stopped because I think it also can show us a, a an important part of what it means to push ourselves which is you know yes push yourself bar hard, keep going until you can't go anymore and then go a little bit further. Uh, but at a certain point, right, it makes sense to rest. It makes sense to pause. It makes sense to stop. And you didn't want or need to win that race so badly that you would risk an injury that would set you back for weeks or months. You yeah. didn't, you didn't need your ego to be inflated so much that you were willing to risk um, weeks and months of your life afterward. And that's, that's an okay decision to make. You know, that's a rational, probably good decision to make. And I think people get caught up sometimes on the smaller scale of needing to take a break or pause or needing to take a step back, maybe in part because they see people on social media like you, like me, like other people running that race, right? Uh, they see people and they think, man, Nathan never stops. Uh, Joe never quits. Um, this guy, that guy, this girl, that girl, they never take a break. The truth is like, we all need rest from time to time and none of us can go forever without stopping periodically. And I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there and then I want to go back through the race. And if you could pick out a couple of those dark, hard moments, I would love to hear about them. Yeah, hundred percent. So the first eight hours of the race, like you're obviously you're feeling super good. It was a 12 o'clock start time, which is kind of a weird time for, for a race, but, uh, it was 80 degrees. It was 85 degrees, sunny. It was, it was a pretty hot day, but going into the night, I'd say it was definitely, uh, it was a pretty tough moment, but I, I remember one moment specifically, it was, uh, it was like three in the morning. And so you gotta you go back to a checkpoint every every 4.2 miles and you gotta sit there for like six, seven minutes, which is honestly brutal because you start cramping up and it, it's just it's not enough time to to rest. So I just remember sitting there in the chair, like with a blanket over my head. I slept for like three minutes. I was literally asleep for three minutes. And you know, you all these dark thoughts just go through your head, like, should I give up? Uh and everyone else, a lot of people are giving up at that point at three o'clock in the morning. So it's like, you know, should I just give up? Like you start asking yourself these questions, like, is it worth it? All these, all these different questions. But I remember, I mean, I had an awesome support crew too. So they weren't going to let me, let me give in. But uh, I just remember getting up and going to the start line and just erasing all the negative thoughts that I had, because I mean, it's a race, there's going to be negative thoughts throughout, but uh, I was able to put those aside and just, just keep hammering out miles. So definitely, definitely felt good. But that was definitely, that was one moment that I really was like, it was, it was tough. Mm -hmm. Do you think if you didn't have a support system there with you that maybe you would have stopped at that point? I'd like to say no, but I mean, it's definitely, it's certainly possible. I think surrounding yourself with an amazing support team is, is huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. And I know some people, they don't have that support team, uh, to, to get them going. But, uh, I was, I was thankful to have them. And I'd like, I'd like to think my mindset was, is strong enough where if I didn't have them, then I could continue to push through, but they were definitely a big factor in the race. Sure. And earlier in our conversation, I pointed out how comparison on social media might be a negative consequence of, of social media for some people. I think on the flip side, uh, if you don't have a support system, you and I can both attest to the fact that there are so many amazing human beings that you can meet and nurture actual relationships with through social media. 
And if you want to create a support system for yourself and be part of a support system for other people, you know, social media is a great way to do that. Uh, you just have to put some effort into finding the right people. Um, because at, at this point, right, you and I both have followings and we both have networks where we probably feel a certain amount of pressure to show up and to keep mm. showing up. And that pressure doesn't have to be a bad thing, but I'm sure on the days where it's, you know, it's very unappealing to put out a video and spend that time filming and editing and creating, I'm sure it goes through your mind, right? There are people who are following you who would love to see a video and who count on you in a lot of ways to create encouraging, uplifting, and inspiring content. Exactly. And it's funny too, because the days that I don't feel like posting, it's it's weird when I post that video, sometimes that's like my most viral video that I'll, that I'll ever have. It's just, it's just kind of how it works. It's, it's super funny. Do you have a favorite video you've ever created? Like, you know, hands down, this one is my favorite because, or do you just enjoy all of them? I kind of just enjoy all of them. I'll say like the longer form stuff that I create uh, on Instagram, I, I want to get more into YouTube, longer form content, but I posted some longer form videos on Instagram that I really love. But as you know, they, they don't do as well just because people's attention span is like a goldfish now. They just... They like the seven second to seven to 15 second videos, but I definitely, I'd say putting a lot of effort into like the minute long videos where you focus on the transitions, uh, the shots. I think those are some of my favorite for sure. Yeah. All right. We're going on a bit of a tangent here, but I promise I'll bring it back. Uh, what do you think you would be doing today if social media didn't exist for you? You know, that's, that's a great question. Like, like going back, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be lost, dude. I, I really, I don't know where, where the hell I'd be. Uh, probably, probably working a job that I really don't, don't, don't like and don't, I'm not passionate for. Uh, I can confidently say that the social media has changed my life forever, and it's just, it's just such a big opportunity right now because it's growing so fast and everyone's on social media. But yeah, without it, I, I I'd say I'd, I'd be lost. It's like it's that's a tough question to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good news is we don't have to find out because we're exactly. here. Exactly. Uh, so I have a quote, it's on the longer side, but when you were talking about, you know, 3am, 4am, those, those dark moments where it would be tempting to quit or give in, it made me think of a conversation I had with a client in front of mine, James Boria. He bear crawled an ultra marathon through the streets of New York city. Um, and oh yeah, James is, James is a beast and there it's hard to put into words the experience that I had as James's coach, uh, being part of his process leading up to that event, and then walking alongside him for almost 24 hours as he crawled on his hands and feet through the streets of New York City. And you have this grown man who's on his hands and knees at times, head down on the pavement. Um, people are just, you know, walking past him like nothing's going on, and he's just in so much pain asking how much longer and you're telling him we've got one more mile and that last mile just takes forever and it hurts so bad and it hurts to watch him. And I share all that because this quote to me really applies to anyone at any point where they think of giving in or giving up. So uh, the quote is from Matt Fitzgerald and he said, every athlete who has pushed beyond his or her known limits of endurance in the quest for improvement understands these sentiments. There is no experience quite like that of driving yourself to the point of wanting to give up and then not giving up. In that moment of raw reality, when something inside you asks, how bad do you want it? An inner curtain is drawn open, revealing a part of you that is not seen except in moments of crisis. And when your answer is to keep pushing, you come away from the trial with a kind of self-knowledge and self-respect that can't be bought. And it's just this like, beautiful image of you, you're faced with this wall and it feels like a wall, but really it's a curtain. And when you want to give up, you just have to choose to pull that curtain open and step through. And on the other side of that is this self-understanding and this self-respect that you can't gain in any other way other than doing hard things. And I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think that is definitely, that's a beautiful quote right there. And I experienced that exact same thing in my sub 252 or my 252 marathon. Uh, I was going for the sub three attempt and at mile 21, I 
you know, you feel this awful pain in your legs, you're, you're exhausted, you're absolute gas. And, you know, you see people walking on the side already and you're like, you kind of want to give in too. your, your brain just starts telling you like, Oh, give up, give up. But you just keep pushing. You keep pushing from mile 22 to 23 to 24. And then mile 25 comes and, you know, the finish line's kind of in sight and you just, you just keep pushing through. But, uh, yeah, I think pushing through the pain is, is absolutely essential if you, if you want to accomplish big things. And I was able to do that in my sub three marathon. I was very, very proud of it. So you and I can and will geek out on a lot of this uh, mindset related stuff that we're talking about and we'll keep talking about it. But I just want to pause for a second and share that when I was 22, I thought a lot like you think. And I think it was received by certain people in my life who are older than I was as you're just naive. You don't know how hard the world actually is. Um, you you won't feel like that forever kind of thing. And, uh, granted I'm only eight years older. I'm only 30. I still got a lot of growing up to do. Uh, but I still feel the same way. And I think those people are wrong. And, uh, it's sad to watch people who get so beaten down by life that, uh, this pessimism, uh, just is pervasive in their minds and they're not able to see the positive. They're not able to take ownership. Uh, and I just say that because I see so much of me and you and people told me that I wouldn't keep it. Um, but I have, and I know you will, and I hope people listening will keep those parts of themselves, uh, that resonate with this conversation. So I don't know, do, do you ever get any of that in real life on social media or not? Yeah, especially that? like I said, I just graduated as well. So everyone's asking like, you know, wow, what's next in life? Like, how are the interviews going? Like all these, all these questions. And I tell them, oh, I'm going to be coaching. I'm going to be pursuing my social media. And, you know, that's not, that's not mainstream now. Like getting a corporate job and doing work in the nine to five, that's like, that's what I, that's what a lot of people do. And I mean, obviously this is the riskier path, which I'm going to be going on, but I know I can, I can persevere through, but I get that from, from a lot of people, not really on the social media side, but just, it's more your family. It's more, more close friends and those people. And, you know, I've had close friends tell me, Oh, why'd you start a little fitness page? Like back, back in the day. And and now look at it. It's just, people aren't going to see your vision. Like from, from the beginning, like, from from the start, running was I love running, and then I just started pursuing bigger races, and that was so I could eventually start coaching for for running and and teaching people the skills that I've learned. But people people just don't see that from the start. That's a great point. People won't see your vision until it uh, becomes tangible, and uh, people might not believe in your process until it gets to a certain point. But that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your vision or your process. It just means that you have to be willing to be misunderstood. Um, And on that note, I I think family, friends, people close to us, they know a version of us. And as we grow and as we change, uh, if who we're becoming doesn't match who we've always been in their eyes, that can be hard for people. And the people who care about us want the best for us. And also, I think people are afraid of things they don't understand. So back to your point of being misunderstood and people not seeing the vision you have in your mind, that's scary to people who care about you because Mm -hmm. you're going down this very unknown, seemingly uncertain path. Um, But we have to be willing to pursue the things that matter, even if other people don't see it with us. Exactly. So with all that being said, uh, this is the Project Endure podcast. And you're an endurance athlete. You exist in that space when you hear the word endurance, what does that mean to you? So endurance really means being able to to just push through and and not quit. So that could be mile 25 in the marathon, pushing through and enduring. It could be, you know, starting your own business. It's it's pushing through uh, from the people that that are hating on your business. It's just enduring the process. Um, And it could be mile 90 of a hundred mile race. It's just it's persevering and being able to push through, uh, when there's noise in the background. Mm. So with that being said, I think the words that come to mind when I think of endurance and when I hear your definition are no matter what, uh, continuing to push forward and move forward, no matter what. And it also brings to mind this term that's new to me, 
and a term that's challenging to me and I think a lot of people, that term is flexible discipline. Um, I'd never heard it before maybe three, four weeks ago. Uh, but to me, flexible discipline as a concept is a slippery slope because at some point you get toward the, the end of the spectrum where excuses exist. So, you know, what's the difference between saying you're going to do something and doing it no matter what versus pivoting when it makes sense, pausing when it makes sense, maybe reassessing along the way and adjusting goals as you go. So I don't know if you have thoughts on what's the difference between an excuse and a rational decision, but I would love to hear any you have, as well as how you approach the topic of discipline. Yeah. So I'd say an excuse, like I'll just bring it back to like fitness terms. Like, you know, I don't want to get up early. So, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it later in the night. And then later in the night comes on and you just, you don't feel like doing it. I feel like, I feel like that's more, more of an excuse hundred percent. Mm. I, um, I've thought about this a lot and I think the beautiful thing about making decisions is that we get feedback from decisions. And so I'll talk with clients about this at times, you know, when you get up in the morning, right? Like I set my alarm for three 30, four o'clock in the morning, most days, 95% of the time I get up when my alarm goes off and 5% of the time I might decide that it's not the morning for me to go push myself at the gym. Uh, you know, and my body could use two, three hours of extra sleep and that's what's best for me. Hmm. The only reason I feel comfortable making that decision at this point in my life is because I have had enough times where I have snoozed the alarm and overslept and told myself that I was too tired to work out and then felt this sense of guilt later in the day and I had these, <laughs> right. And had these thoughts like, you know what? Yeah, I was tired, but I also should have worked out. And in hindsight, that feedback gives me information. The next time I wake up feeling like that, I know what decision I should make and I know I should go to the gym. And on the flip side, there have been plenty of mornings, you know, over the past decade plus of my life where I've woken up, alarm goes off at 334. I'm exhausted, drained. My body hurts. It's just screaming at me for more rest. And I have this, I'm in this mode where I'm just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm go, I'm getting up and I'm going and I work out and then I get sick or I work out and then I just can't function that day and I push it too far. And that's feedback for me as well. So I think my point of saying all this is when we make decisions, sometimes we're, we're, we make good ones. Sometimes we mess up, but we get the feedback of how we feel after we make that decision. And we can use that to refine the process the next time to limit excuses. That makes sense. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say never go like two days without like, don't skip two, two, two mornings. Mm. Uh, I think that's definitely, that's definitely powerful. Like if you skip one morning, make sure you're up the next morning. Mm. What's the hardest habit that you've had to develop over the past few years, right? You seem to me, we've talked about the video editing and social media. You're locked in there. Uh, from what it appears, fitness, you're locked in. Are there habits behind the scenes maybe that are just really hard for you to develop and maybe you haven't mastered that muscle yet in a certain area? It's more just, I, I just, it's always just been the discipline. Like just, you have to show up every single day and just drilling that inside of my head. Like there's, I mean, there's not really, there's, I can't really take a day off at this point. Like I'm, I'm too locked in. I'm too far in to, to take a day off. So it's really just building, building up that discipline and, and just showing up every single day and getting up at five. I get up around five o'clock every single morning to, to fit enough time in, in for the day, because the 24 hours, that's really, it's, it's not that much time, but, uh, it's really, yeah, I, I definitely lacked in the discipline at first, but, uh, after 75 hard, I just haven't looked back since. Yeah. And I've had stretches where that's me in every area of life. And I think I've, <laughs> I've also had, uh, these moments of awareness where, you know, I think, okay, I'm just locked in bulletproof. I'm a hundred percent for a hundred percent. I'm showing up in every area of my life. And then, uh, I realized, oh my gosh, I haven't flossed since like, I haven't flossed my teeth in like a year. Uh, okay. That's an exaggeration, but like, <laughs> oh, it's, it's been like three months. 
And every time I go to the dentist, I swear to myself, I'm like, dude, you're going to floss every day for the rest of your life. And eventually it falls off. And I realize, like, okay, fitness, incredibly important to me. Showing up for my clients, for my wife, for my, my family, the people close to me, so important. Um, writing as a practice, journaling, so important. I don't miss those. But I don't know, flossing my teeth? Like, it's just, it's, it's so not funny. up there. It's so funny that you say that because I've told myself the same exact thing and I've fallen off with it. <laughs> it's like the same example that you've used, that it's, it's happened to me before too. And it's like... It's some, sometimes the simple stuff that just that ends up falling off. It's which is crazy. It is crazy. And the interesting piece about it all as a coach, and maybe you can relate on this level too, is right. I work with people who they struggle to get up when their alarm goes off. They struggle to get their workouts done. They struggle to push themselves in the ways that have become easier for me. It's become routine. It's just become who I am. So it's very easy for me you know, almost on a subconscious level to, to think or say like, it's not that hard, right? You just got to say it and then you got to do it. You have to commit to it. And then I realize how hypocritical that can be because there's a dentist out there listening, right? I have a client who's a dentist, if you're listening, uh, and to them, flossing is so important. It's second nature. It's like, come on, man, like just say it and do it. And to me, I fall off. So I, I have to remember to have compassion and grace and understanding that, you know, what's e become easier for me isn't always easy for other people. And there are those areas of my own life where I fall off uh, from time to time. So tonight, after this episode, I'm flossing. You heard it. I, I will too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that being said, you know, this podcast is meant to help encourage people to find strength within their struggle, to do hard things, to adopt a different perspective, to better their lives. And the truth is there are people listening to this podcast who don't even have the bandwidth to think, you know, I'm going to post on social media every day, or I'm going to build muscle, or I'm going to run faster and further because they are just so stuck and lost and in this dark place where it feels like, they just have a blanket over their head at 3 a.m. and they have six minutes to rest, but it's it's not a race for them. That's every day and they feel that. If you had the chance to just say anything to encourage or inspire somebody who's in a dark, hard season, what would you say to them? I think I'd really say is you just have to get out of your comfort zone. As we talked about earlier, change is everything. Like obviously the position that you're in right now, it, it sucks. It's, it's tough, but uh, you have to, you have to change. You have to, you have to do hard things. You have to get out of your comfort zone to, you know, experience new things in the world. You never know where these hard things are going to lead you. Like it did for me doing a 75 hard. It was, it was a tough thing. It was a scary thing, but you know, it, it changed my life forever. Just from one simple decision saying, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to start tomorrow's day one. So I'd say, you know, and take take action now, hundred percent. Maybe even after this after this podcast that you listen to, take action now. Uh, write down your goals, set a goal, and take action tomorrow, and it will change your life forever. Beautiful. Um, you just sparked a thought. I, I saw this. Uh, it was an Instagram post, but I want to turn it into a poster for my office. And it was a simple, just uh, like a billboard, and it said, "Yesterday, comma." you said tomorrow. And uh, it's that idea of like, man, we all, we all do that to ourselves, right? I'll work out tomorrow. I'll run tomorrow. I'll make that post tomorrow. I'll floss tomorrow. And then it becomes tomorrow. And yesterday we said we would do it tomorrow. And that cycle repeats itself. So if you're listening and there's anything you take away from this section, like break the cycle, do something hard, step outside of your comfort zone. And there are people out there to support you, even if you don't know them. And there are so many people creating content like you, Nathan, that will you know, get you out of bed in the morning. Um, and so if people want to follow along and they want to see what you're up to and uh, feel inspired, where's the best place for them to do that? So on Instagram, you can follow me at Nathan D. Wilkins. So it's N-A-T-H-A-N-D-W-I-L-K-I-N-S. Okay, I got to ask, what's the D stand for? So that's just, that's my middle name, Dale. Dale. That's yeah. a great middle name. It's a pretty good middle name. It is. Okay. One more question for you before we wrap up yep. in the order of triplets, where do you fall? So I am right in the middle. 
Okay. Is there like competition between you and your siblings as to like, you know, like I'm stronger than you are, I'm better than you are, I'm smarter than you are. Are you guys like all best buds? So in high school, I mean, that's where my competitive drive really came from. We're all extremely competitive towards each other. We all we all want to beat each other, obviously. But uh once we all kind of went our separate ways with school, we got extremely close. Like we're each other's biggest supporters, which it's like a built-in support system, which is it's absolutely amazing. But uh yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate you. I appreciate this conversation and everything that you're doing and can't wait to watch your continued growth. And uh, I'm very, very grateful that we got to have this talk. I am too. It was an amazing talk, man. It was great finally meeting you as well. Likewise. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.